Now we're going to introduce something called the Mobius inversion formula, which we'll see actually arises quite naturally from work we've already done. We're going to begin by taking a look at the Mobius function mu. Now we know that is a multiplicative function. Since the summatory function of a multiplicative function is multiplicative, the summatory function of mu will also be multiplicative, and maybe it's worth looking at. So temporarily, we're going to denote the summatory function of mu as g. We're actually going to see that the summatory function of mu is a function we've already seen. Now, since g is multiplicative, we only need to compute how it acts on prime powers. Of course, divisors of prime powers are easy to list out, so we plug them all into the Mobius function mu. And as we've seen before, these powers of primes are easy to compute the Mobius function on. As long as k is one or bigger, we're going to include this term here, but all of these higher powers of the prime are divisible by p squared, so the Mobius function is going to spit out a zero. So as long as k was one or bigger, and we do in fact include this term, g of p to the k works out to be zero. Observe if k is zero and you're actually just computing g of one, you're only going to have this term here and you'll just get mu of one. So g is multiplicative and it evaluates all prime powers to zero. g of one is just mu of one, which is one. So g evaluates one to one and everything else to zero. It is the epsilon function that we've seen before. We already knew this in fact, because we have established that mu is the Dirichlet inverse of the one function. The convolution of mu with the one function is just this epsilon function. And of course, convolution with the one function is exactly taking the summatory function. So now suppose f is any arithmetic function, and let's call its summatory function capital F. Well, f is just the convolution with the identity element. However, since the Mobius function is the Dirichlet inverse of the one function, this convolution is the same thing as the identity element. Dirichlet convolution is commutative, so I can replace the convolution of mu with one, with one with mu. It's also associative, so I can instead move these parentheses and say, let's do the convolution of f with the one function. In other words, there is its summatory function, capital F. Overall, the arithmetic function f is equal to the convolution of its summatory function with the Mobius function. This is called the Mobius inversion formula. From this, we can see if we know the summatory function capital F, if we perform a convolution with the Mobius function, we can re-extract the original function F or what I call the anti-summatory function. So let's use this formula. We can recover an arithmetic function f when we know or are otherwise given what its summatory function is. Okay, And again, in the non-standard terminology, this is not a term you'll see in other places, I call this the anti-summatory function of capital F. So let's find a function whose summatory function is the one function. Well, by the Mobius inversion formula, if the summatory function of little f is the, the one function, then f is simply the convolution of one with the Mobius function. So let's go ahead and compute that. Of course, the one function always spits out one. So in fact, f of n is simply the sum over the divisors of n of the mu function. Since one is multiplicative, so is its anti-summatory function. We know a function is multiplicative if and only if its summatory function is, therefore if and only if its anti-summatory function is. So we only need to compute the values of f on prime powers. And again, the divisors of prime powers are easy to list out. This uh, quotient that we have to compute here, all it really says is when I have a divisor of one, I get p to the k first, and I count down my powers instead of up, but this is a sum we've seen before. Every term except these two will vanish, and the resulting sum is zero. f must evaluate all prime powers to zero, and indeed f of one is one again, so we get the epsilon function. We could have seen this a little bit earlier. Up here, we have the sum over the factors of n, mu of the cofactors, but if I list out the factors, that's equivalent to listing out the cofactors. So here we could have recognized this as the summatory function of the Mobius function, which on the previous slide we computed to be the epsilon function. So overall, we were asked find a function whose summatory function is the one function, and we observed the function whose summatory function is the one function must only be the epsilon function. Let's take a look at another example. Suppose f is an arithmetic function whose summatory function is n. 
compute lowercase f of 200. So the summatory function capital F is multiplicative, f of, capital F of n is n. Therefore, the original function f is multiplicative, so we only need to know how to evaluate it on prime powers, and we can use that to figure out how it acts on any number. By the Mobius inversion formula, f of any value is the sum over the divisors of that value, the summatory function times the Mobius function on a cofactor. Now we simply list all of these things out because factors of prime powers are easy to list out. The Mobius function is wonderfully convenient here. Everything vanishes except for the last two terms, and we use the fact that capital F was given to just be the identity function. So capital F of n is n. So here we have capital F of p to the k minus 1. Here we have capital F of p to the k. Overall, we simply get p to the k minus p to the k minus 1, which we could factor like this. So if lowercase f is an arithmetic function whose summatory function is n, it must act on prime powers in this way. So whatever this anti-summatory function is, it's completely defined by this observation. It's multiplicative, and we now know how it acts on prime powers. So we can now see how to evaluate 200. 200 evaluates as uh, factors, sorry, as 2 cubed times 5 squared. Since f is multiplicative, we can split it up like this. Here the prime is 2, the power is 3, so I get 2 minus 1, 2 to the 3 minus 1, 2 minus 1, 2 to the 3 minus 1. Here the prime is 5 and the power is 2, so we get 5 minus 1 times 5 to the 2 minus 1. 5 minus 1 times 5 to the 2 minus 1. We evaluate all these terms and we get 80. So whatever this function f is, f of 200 must be 80. Let's close out this video with yet one more example. Suppose lowercase f is an arithmetic function whose summatory function is capital F of n is 2n plus 1. Can we compute the value f of 50? Now, capital F is not multiplicative. Okay, we observe that capital F of 1 would be 3. Since capital F of 1 isn't 1, it's definitely not a multiplicative function. So since the summatory function, capital F, isn't multiplicative, neither is the original function or anti-summatory function, lowercase f. So deriving a formula for how lowercase f acts on prime powers is actually quite doable, but it won't be helpful for this problem because we don't know that lowercase f is multiplicative. In fact, we know that it isn't but we can still just apply the Mobius inversion formula. Lowercase f of 50 will be the sum over the factors of 50, capital F of the factor times mu of the cofactor. And the factors of 50 can just be listed out. They're simply 1, 2, 5, 10, 25, and 50. There aren't actually that many factors, so we can just compute this sum by hand. Now, mu of 50 and mu of 25 are both zero because 50 and 25 have square factors, 25 specifically. Mu of 10 is 1, mu of 5 and mu of 2 are both negative 1, and mu of 1 is 1. So we in fact just have f of 5 minus f of 10 minus f of 25 plus f of 50, and capital F of n is just 2n plus 1. So we just have 11 minus 21 minus 51 plus 101 for a total result of 40. So even though lowercase f wasn't multiplicative, you can still use the Mobius inversion formula as long as the number in question doesn't have too many positive factors to list out by hand, it's still quite doable as a problem.